Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, and a friend of the show with plenty to fill us in on. will be joining us very shortly too. But speaking of filling people in, we've missed a couple of weeks, Johnny, so I should personally apologise for that absence, but not much has changed, has it, in the world of rugby or the real world? It's all the same, yeah? A little bit's changed in your world. Do you want to fill us in? <laughs> we have had a baby a couple of weeks ago, and it's fair to say it didn't all go smoothly, but it's on the straight and narrow, we hope, now. But Emmy became a big sister. Rafa's yep. doing well. You're eating a pot noodle, which makes me realise that you're right back <laughs> into the shit stage of being a dad again. And you mentioned it didn't go easy. Will there be a number three? Is the vasectomy booked in already? Or what were I thinking? did ask if they could do it there and then, but yeah, <laughs> apparently that's not allowed. And you must be like, it's not about you, Tim. It's not about you, Tim. <laughs> I don't think a third was ever on the cards, Johnny, but it definitely isn't now, it's safe to say. Uh, yeah, I've seen more than enough hospital over the course of the last couple of weeks. About 100 trips there and back, I reckon. But um, we've chatted a couple of times, but this is the first time you've seen me for mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. So do I look three weeks older, Fresh. three years older? You're, you're glowing, mate. <laughs> glowing. <laughs> You're probably lactating. I've got no idea. <laughs> Your dad bod is just going to get worse and worse. Take it from me. <laughs> How are you anyway? How are you? Good, mate. It's been it's been a nice. Um, I can't remember the last time we actually did a podcast. It's been a nice <laughs> couple of week couple of weeks break. Um, been working on Via Play, who've taken over from Premier Sports. Mm. Um, a couple of top fourteen games. Everything's been good here. A couple of weeks of sort of downtime after the Autumn Nations, which is great. Um, and then on to European stuff this weekend that I'm sure that we'll get to but no otherwise mate family's good rugby's been good looking forward to Christmas life is good and when I said nothing's changed I kind of meant rugby rather than myself but we will come on to the Champions Cup get our guest on shortly but we've got to touch on the dismissals of Eddie Jones and Wayne Pivak were they both the right calls for you or not? Yeah, look, look, Gats clearly has been Wales' greatest ever coach. Like, incredibly hard to play against. Horrible going down to play against the sides when he was Welsh coach. Um, and I think that papered over cracks in the regional game at the time. As a national team, they've punched above their weight because they had a great coach. Now that he's gone, everything's gone loose. Um, Pivak, you have to say, like in his time, I thought they were going to be wooden spoon contenders. They won a Six Nations when he was there, but then... Since then, like losing to Italy, losing to Georgia in Cardiff is tragic. And just sort of general form, it's all split, slipped and confidence clearly isn't there. So 100% the right time to act. And in my opinion, the same again with Eddie. Um, like bizarrely, though, if you look through the stats, like he leaves as the best win percentage of any England coach of all time. Got him to World Cup final, three Six Nations titles, 18 match winning streak, I think at one point. Um, but that was all before 2019. And since then, yeah, something just hasn't seemed right. It's not been settled. Um, fifth in the 2021 Six Nations. Last year wasn't great either. Beaten at Twickenham by the Pumas. Embarrassed. I'm not sure that's a strong word, but I would say in certain facets of their game that they have real pride. Embarrassed by South Africa. And they just looked a little bit lost. So with all the players they have, um, the depth of talent, I think a breath of fresh air is probably just what they need as well. Um, I actually thought Gats would have been an excellent shout as the next English coach as well. And um, I saw Sam, Sam Warburton, I mentioned that uh, this week as well. I thought he'd have been fantastic for them um, just to get them back to playing simple, basic rugby, what they do really well, getting those bits right and then building upon it. Um, I don't know. We don't know who's going to come in and take that job 100% yet, but... There's not many games for these coaches now. They have a Six Nations, a couple of warm-up games, then it's World Cup time. So you can imagine there won't be much tinkering, but they have to get in there, do a job, um, have an electro shock, as they call it over in France, change something, um, get the players smiling again, full of confidence, and kick things off really quickly in the Six Nations because it's going to come around like they've got, what, a month prep? If you're a coach now, you've got a month prep. You've got a week and a half, two weeks with the players. So... Much easier for Warren Gatland, more difficult for somebody coming into England, um, but probably now makes the Calcutta game kicking off that tournament um, a little bit harder now for Scotland going down to Twickenham, definitely. Yeah, the Eddie Jones one seems to have split opinion a little bit more given his talk of a grand plan for the last few years. I remember there's, there's only so long you can, like a grand plan, grand plan, like your test match coach, you're judged on the there and now. Like, it, it doesn't work like that. You can't, produce absolute garbage for two years and say, don't worry, lads, it'll all be good 
in nine months' time. It, it, it just doesn't fly. So I think it's the right decision. I, I know loads of people don't agree with me. A lot of players that he's coached as well, like you're not going to hear any former or recently former players or players that are still in the squad fighting for him. Um, and clearly it's device of you guys like James Haskell coming out, defending him, big ally, Mike Brown, <laughs> tearing him to shreds. Um, but what is clear from the outside, not being attached to anyone in that camp or knowing Eddie Jones at all, is that the product, what they're producing on the field, isn't good enough with the finance that goes in behind the player pool they have. They should be doing better. So change was required, to according to me, but completely different for everyone else. You mentioned he had the highest win percentage of any coach, which is absolutely factually correct. But you also yep. mentioned it was all a few years it ago. It was all front-ended. 55%. Over the last two years, as an England head coach, that no, clearly isn't not, good enough. That's not acceptable. Not acceptable. And the weird thing is that although they were utterly dominant in some aspects of their play when he first came in, they've looked easy to play against, which is never something that you associate with an English side. Like as a Scotland side going down, looking to win at Twickenham for your first time since the 80s. Like that's what we're talking about. Now you look at Calcutta, I'm losing this, using the Scottish example, but it's almost a 50-50 split over the past three, four, five years. Um, and that has been historically almost impossible for us to achieve. So it's bizarre. His win percentage is still the highest, but it's been totally front-loaded. Um, and the reason that he's been removed is because the last two years it hasn't been acceptable. Uh, it hasn't been acceptable for an English national coach to have 55% win percentage. No way. And from a French perspective, obviously, when Wales and England make these changes, everyone on social media says, Sean Edwards, but we know he signed up for loads more with France. So there's no go there. But it's interesting, isn't it? There's all this upheaval. And we're sort of in an alternate universe because everyone else is making changes. And if you're looking for serenity, France, it's not normally the case, is it? It is bonkers. But then for the first time in a very, very long time, France have got a settled coaching staff that are performing with a generation of outstanding young players. So quite rightly, Sean has signed up for more. And I do not blame him. He's happy in Perpignan. He loves working with a French squad. I think he signed up for four more years. Um, and that's it. That It's even more wild that people back home, they have no, maybe don't have any idea that he's here or that he's doing a job or that he's re-signed. But He's here, he's happy, he's attached to a winning squad that's performing. Um, they absolutely love him as well. They were desperate for him to re-sign um, and he was quite right to do so. Speaking of coaching changes, let's get our guests on now because there was one in the top 14 not so long ago as Christophe Urias exited stage left at Bordeaux and we can have a chat with friend of the show, Zach Holmes, and find out how everything's going down there. How you doing, Zach? Yeah, really good. Um, it's nice to be back on. It's yeah, always listening to you boys every week, so it's good to see the podcast doing well and nice to be back chatting with you boys it's good to have you back and it's been a while a lot's happened since we last spoke and i'm guessing it's been a tumultuous few weeks as well at the club so give us a lowdown on how everything's unfolded yeah it was i think it's a bit of a surprise to everyone or the, or the playing group um yeah so we had the match against poe which yeah is our worst match of the year um where we what got got beaten pretty badly um, and then it was we sort of had the holidays after that straight away so uh, we had 10 days off um, and then I think the decision was made just before we came back so maybe the Monday or the Tuesday before we returned to training on the on the Wednesday um, and yeah so we came back into training on the Wednesday Christoph wasn't there um, Fred and Julian both the, the assistants uh, um had take well we're taking sort of his his role um and then we sort of just gone from there we had a, a players sort of uh meeting on the on wednesday night sort of barbecue drinks to see um yeah just what everyone thought about it what changes needed to be made um the general consensus was um yeah we we not too much needs to change we just need to yeah just just a few things with our game um Maybe a few things with the way we train as well, but yeah, overall not too much, and and yeah, we've sort of just continued on after. I mean, so on those little things that you mentioned that you were going to change, a bit of a losing streak, not the start of the season you wanted, then obviously a big win at the weekend uh, at home against Breve. Now that the assistants have stayed and they're running things, have you able to have a bit of a collaborative environment where you go to them and say, look, we've as a player group, this is what we think, this is what we could tweak that would help. How is it working now that Christoph's been removed and he's no longer there? Because ultimately, before he was controlling everything, um, 
now are you able to go to Julian and to Fred and to have a bit of back and forth? How does it work now? Yeah, so Julian and Fred were pretty open from the beginning about what their expectations were, but they wanted to have an environment where the players and especially the leaders of the group are able to express what they want. I'm not saying without Christoph that didn't happen because there's leaders meetings every every Monday. There's a lot of different different stuff going on, but I know that they made it clear that they want the the players to express um, what changes, if any, that, that they need or, or ways to improve. Not so much changes, but things we can do better. Um, and you're always looking for that. So um, I'm not in all the leaders' meetings, um, but, yeah, a few of them that I, I have been in. Um, yeah, Fred and Julian are, are quite open to just, our, I guess, the players' perspective of, of how we can train better, what we can do better in our games and how we can incorporate that. Um, and I think there's been some subtle changes, nothing, nothing too drastic, not, not anything system based on how we play or not changing, I guess the function of the week or anything like that, but um, a few subtle things, a few little changes on the way we train, focusing more on certain aspects. And I think hopefully as, as the season continues, um, we'll be able to see improvements with that in our game. When you talk about the reaction of when you found out and then you went and digested it over a beer, were you fairly shocked? Because I was. I'm like, as much as there might be short-term a blip with Christoph, you look at the success he delivered at Oyanax, you look at what he did when I was there at Cast, took Bordeaux to the top six for the first time, got them to knock out phases of Champions Cup rugby. That had never been done at Bordeaux. So, like, is there a little bit of awareness from the boys of shit actually what comes in might not be better and it might have just been a temporary little form thing and we, this is actually a bit of a shock that he's now gone yeah well I, I can only sort of say on my, my sort of perspective and I, I've always looked at Christoph from the outside and seen what he's done and always looked at him and been quite well he admired what he's done with the teams that he's coached and and then, and then working with him for well not not a long time four months but I really um yeah, respected him as a coach. And I, I really found his management style to be really good for me. I, I found he's really direct. He lets you know what he expects. Um, yeah, and, he, and he's clear with that. Um, so for me personally, it was, it was a big shock. I, I, we've underperformed, but we've still had good performances. The, the first match against Toulouse, we, lo we lost, which a match we probably shouldn't have lost. And and we just haven't been able to pick up uh, wins away. But it's a, you look at the so table hard. at the top 14 this season, like where everyone's on the it's, – it's, it's so tight. Um, Poe, Bayonne, um, yeah, they're, they're not – you can't go there and just expect to win. Like to lose haven't – like you, it's just so tight. So I think it was tough in, in that regard. But I'm sure there's more to it than – just, just the results. Um, but yeah, that's the president's decision. And the, at the end of the day, it, it's he, he's got to make the decisions on what he thinks best for the club going forward. Um, he's done that. And as a playing group, we just need to, to up our performance. Um, I think the group we've got in Bordeaux is it's a good group. Um, we are starting to probably play with a bit more confidence. Um, and then hopefully, yeah, we're in the mix when it comes to the right end of the season. But, yeah, it was a surprise to me. I think like most people in rugby, it was a surprise too. But, yeah, to, it was as we've seen with England, with Wales, like, yeah, um, sometimes those big decisions have to be made. And was it mainly Christoph who brought you to Bordeaux or did the negotiations that have happened above him? Because I wonder what it's like as a player who's just come into an environment expecting to obviously work with a coach for the long term and then this happens. Do you feel quite sort of vulnerable or um yeah there there is because i knew that christoph did sort of want me to be here and appreciate the way that i play so when he i guess he leave you don't not certain who's come in i know that fred and julian will will be here for the the rest of the season and then and then whoever comes after you you're not sure how how they may uh view you um i know yeah with me signing here it was Christoph and, and Fred as well, who I, I I spoke to a few times before before signing and and to be 
probably complementary to Matthew in the same style. So they didn't have to, I guess, change game plans, which, um, yeah, I guess Francois, Francois Chanduk played a, a, a bit of a different game, a bit more controlling, probably um, utilising more, yeah, his kicking game and, and so. Um, so that was sort of the reason. Um, but... Yeah, there's always when it when a coach changes, you don't you're not too sure um, how another coach is going to receive you. Um, but all you can do is just control your performance, I guess. And have you been told internally? I know it's not been announced as like a name that's floating around that everyone's talking about in France. But have they told you, right, boys? The situation is that these assistants are going to take you through to the end of the season, or is somebody going to come in and consult as a head coach till the end of the season, or then they're going to appoint somebody as a head coach at the start of next year? Like, do you know what? the transformation period is going to look like, or is it just as it is for now for the rest of the season? From my understanding and from when the the initial meetings were with Laurent and, 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 and Fred and Julian, like they were taking over and, and that was for the foreseeable future. Uh, I guess I see that as till the end of the season, um, but I guess that could change but from the way I see it it'll stay the same until the end of the season um yeah and 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 in terms of their roles not much has really changed in terms of Julian is with the takes the forwards Fred takes the backs and then it just becomes um more collaborative during the the team meetings where Julian has more of a def- is focused on the defensive as on defense and Fred's focused on attack so um the way it functions it, it, it is quite good they just probably have to be a bit more uh probably not as close with the players oh not so much that but just now that they're more doing their selection of the match and stuff like that becomes a little bit more complicated for them but that's just that's just part of the roles and everyone understands that well, mate, it is hard because Christoph, like, certainly, like, I had Fred and Christoph at cast. And, like, Fred is obviously as an assistant much closer to the players. It's backs as well. So you can all have a laugh. You don't have to do any hard training. It's all a laugh. Um, but now having that flipped, like, have you had to, have you noticed, like, have they had to flip a little bit of personality or, or create a little bit more distance or become a bit more colder? Because that, that was Christoph. Like, Christoph was the chef that would stand up and would orchestrate everything and be that orator. And it was a big role. So it's like, it's a big void to fill as well. To be honest, I haven't noticed them change the way they acted, I guess, with me before. Like, I still talk quite a lot to Fred um, about just how training went, how strategy-wise, what what I think, what Matthew thinks, um, doing extra stuff with him after training. It, it's not really changed. And Julian's the same. Like, I, I think he's probably taken on – Julian's probably taken on a bit more of the Christoph role in terms of the – uh meetings and, and and that kind of role he's probably a bit more vocal i guess than fred generally um but in terms of relationships personally no not really i think they're both quite open they're both wanting the players input in, in how to best improve the team in, in terms of training in terms of strategy for the match in terms in terms of the way that we want to play the game. So I know, I think they see this as a, as a big opportunity for the both of them as well to, to show, to show what they can do in a, you know, sort of bigger, biggest um, scheme, I guess. So I think it, it, it's, it's not ideal the way this it's happened, but it, it's an opportunity and, and the players know we're not even halfway through the season. And we, we've sort of spoken a little bit about it. It's not, it's not a rebuilding year. It's not a, it's not a saison blanche. It's it's we 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 still want to achieve stuff this year, and, and we believe that we can. And Johnny, we can't put Zach on the spot about this. Obviously, he hasn't been told. Yeah, but... yeah we can. <laughs> <laughs> we can put you on the spot anyway. Zach, you can chime in as well. But you mentioned there's a name out there. It's Yannick Brew that the French media are talking about for next season. Yeah. So you can tell Zach. What about Yannick Brew, Johnny? Well, I don't know if it's actually been signed. Like I actually bumped into him randomly about ten days ago in Bayonne. So he was back on a break because uh, he's out with the Sharks working as like a yeah a defense consultant. But he was like, mate, I'm just there learning. Like I'm just there absorbing, trying to absorb as much as I can because they play some pretty good rugby. Um, but he's the he's the man that's been associate, associated with the role. Um, and he was our coach at Bayonne. But in terms of like pure hands-on coaching, like I see Yannick as more as like a director of rugby. Like he's more of a manager, like a not a spokesperson, but 
he's like a really good speaker. He's up for, for management relation, relational pieces like that liaison with the, the president, with the community, with the, like everything that goes around. Like he, I wouldn't say he's a real hands-on rugby coach, but he's like, he's a, he's a good like head of an organization. If, if that makes sense, do you know, like, so like, I would say like if that comparison, like Christoph is more hands-on with his rugby stuff. Um, and Yannick is much more like he is that man that's front and center and speaking and uh, leading the sort of image of the club, if that makes sense. Um, but he's the man that's been associated with the lead role. It'll be really interesting to see as well if he brings in different assistants or if that changes or how much change, how much change he wants to make. I know the press had also mentioned Thibaut Giroud, who had meant to, he was meant to be at Racing, but there was a sort of difference in how they saw that direction with Stuart Lancaster. So he's been released from that contract. Um, so he now can be back on the market as well. He potentially go work with Yannick at Bordeaux. So like, it's an interesting one because I think Yannick needs strong assistant coaches as well with him um, for the pure technical rugby side of the game. So it'll be really interesting to see how it all unfolds, who comes with him, if he is the man for the job, um, and then what direction the club goes in when he arrives. We don't know if it's confirmed or not, but that's the lowdown. <laughs> He's here next week, so we might, <laughs> might say. Exactly, <laughs> that's it. They're coming to town, so you'll take him for an entrecote yeah, we'll and a glass of wine. Like, <laughs> mate, like you haven't arrived yet, but if you could just sort this extension for me. Uh, yeah. Christoph's got me here, but let's get him here long term. Um, yeah, but yeah, mate, that'll be really interesting for him as well. And that's happening with loads of coaches, like Lancaster's playing against Racing with Leinster this weekend. You've got Yannick coming from with the Sharks um, over from Durban to play against you guys. Um, so some pretty yeah, it's pretty tasty games coming up. And just quickly on Christoph, before we move on, you mentioned you didn't really get a chance to work with him for that long, but he is a character, isn't he? And we had some Bordeaux guys on at the end of last season, and particularly in the build up to that barrage game, Johnny, we spoke to Kane Douglas, didn't we? Didn't he? And he, he sort of said <laughs> he'd famously kind of left the players to it for a week to just sort of crack on and said, I'm I'm not having this, I'm not happy with what's been going on. You sort it out, and they did sort it out. So did you notice anything kind of a bit off the wall about Christoph in the early stages of this season, or did he give players the hairdryer treatment, or what did you make of him overall? To be honest, I think he took the end of last season quite 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 hard quite difficult for him um and he and he and it felt like speaking to some of the guys that have been there during the whole time like there was it was more open in terms of um even the way that the weeks were set up like there'd be sort of in, in each block there'd be a week that would be driven by the players so for one of those weeks I was I was injured um so I, I did all the sort of um I think it was against Stade France yeah Stade France and I and the players had the responsibility of doing all the video, all that, presenting in the meetings and stuff like that. And and I found that quite interesting because that's something I, I kind of looking to get into. So for me, it was quite good. But um, yeah, he, he was quite open in that regard, letting the players um, yeah do things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't notice it being like really totalitarian or controlling or to me, if the environment felt, quite good even though performance wise we weren't probably doing as well as they had done or done in previous previous years so for me yeah it, it is surprising but yeah there's probably more going on below the surface to to why but yeah I guess yeah it's sad but I'm sure he'll he'll be back in another club and and he's been successful for a long period of time so I'm sure yeah he'll he'll continue to coach and coach well if anything it just shows us how finite the margins are from like we were talking about Eddie Jones earlier. So Eddie Jones, highest one percentage of any England coach to World Cup final. Then the sort of relationship pieces, the, the the wheels come off a little bit, a few matches don't go right, and you find yourself like Christoph's the same. Like I really enjoyed his environment at cast, a good man, a few personal things that maybe went wrong with calling people out in the press at the end of the season, whether that has an effect on like the overall image, and then a few results. Like you the margins are so small in the top 14. Like you guys are eighth. It's not like you're 14th. Another two wins back to back and you're into top six and everyone's happy again. But I think it just shows us like no matter if you're Wayne Pivak, Eddie Jones, Christoph Urios, that little fine line is so fine now. And it's ridiculous how quickly people can get turfed out of a job. Like it's crazy. Yeah, I definitely agree. It feels almost a little bit more like football. Like like it's almost, yeah, if they want to change the environment or they want to, they need to make a change, which... Yeah, I guess it's a results-based thing. You've only got a limited amount of time. So, yeah, but yeah, it's hard, hard on the coaches. 
And, and on that line, like talking about the Wales and England teams, like just nine months out from World Cup, as an Aussie, what do you make of Eddie Jones being removed? Do you think that is the right call to have taken him out of post from now? Like, do you think he did have a master plan that the RFU have lost it and they'll never get the World Cup back? Or do you think it was the right thing? I, I guess time will tell if it's the right thing or not. Um, I'm interested in who, who replaces him. I think when you, when you look at the options, you look who got people who are just like extended contracts and uh, unavailable. It doesn't seem like there's too many coaches that are available at the moment. So I'm interested in what direction England go. Um, I guess the the major thing for me, Eddie Jones has produced it almost at yeah, every World Cup he's been at. He's, so you, you have to say he knows what he's doing. Um, so yeah, it's a surprise in that regard. I, I guess England's a, yeah, they, they expect results. They, they want good performance. So um, we'll see what happens at the World Cup, I guess. But yeah, I'm interested in what direction they go in and who they appoint to coach because, yeah, it's yeah, close to a World Cup. So, yeah, it's interesting. And as an Australian, could you see Eddie Jones going back and helping Australia at the World Cup potentially? Or if they do make a change either before or after that, heading back to Australia as a head coach one day? I don't know. You don't know with Eddie, do you? You don't know what he's, no. what he, what he's going to do. Um yeah, potentially, but he could just as just as realistically end up helping France. So, or know. being your coach next next year, Zach yeah. Bordeaux. How about that? Imagine. Yeah, he could be. He could be here next season for all I know. But um, that would make. Oh, I don't know how he'd go in France. That would, would be a long, <laughs> a long, a long season. Um, yeah, I don't know how my body would take that. But um, yeah, I think yeah, consultancy wise, I guess. I'm not too sure who he's got close relationships, other coaches. I know he's I uh, worked with Jake White before the World Cup, but he always had a, a relationship with him. So um, I'm not too sure. I, I, I can't see it, but I guess his intelligence, his knowledge of not just just rugby, but even teams who potentially could come against England, um, it could be it could be an advantage. I don't know if it's just media talk, Johnny, but before Stuart Lancaster got the racing job, there was links between Eddie Jones and racing. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we could see him in the top 14. No, you never know. Not at all. I ought, like silly things float around social media as well. Like he was linked with an eight year contract to America, but I'd much rather see him in Bordeaux looking after Zach and just getting him <laughs> through those training sessions. I think, I think that'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> These accents worse than mine, so it probably wouldn't be too bad to have some. Uh, it'd be pretty funny having him screaming at the French boys to to uh, to get off the ground and and, and move around a bit more. It'd be, oh, it'd, be, it'd be hilarious, but yeah, personally can't see it happening. A uh, complete tangent, but I messaged you earlier in the week about your scrum half as well, Jan Lesgurg, who came off a scooter after a social, broke his jaw outside the stadium. Like, how is he getting on? Surely he's getting ridden by the boys for being a muppet but more importantly how is he feeling is he recovering all right yeah i haven't got too many updates i think he, he, he had to have surgery and stuff straight after um he, he's okay now like he's out of hospital and stuff um yeah it was pretty serious um yeah he's fractured his jaw i think he's got some damage to his shoulder or elbow as well like a fracture there so yeah the president spoke to us on monday about it briefly the doctor as well um yeah it's 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 pretty crazy it's it's an incident that yeah um didn't need to happen um but i guess when you take that risk um yeah there's it's it's not good but yeah he's put himself in that position and unfortunately it's happened and thankfully it's not worse um than it is um but yeah i think he's going to be missing for quite a while which is which is a shame because um yeah well, for me he's, he's a really good nine he's probably not had as much opportunity um at the beginning of the season with max max playing quite a lot um and max playing well but yeah it's a shame and it's it's, it's makes yeah and for the club it's difficult as well because um yeah we've lost a nine for quite a few months now and it's a position that is not that easy to come in france at the moment as well which leads me nicely into my next question in France, we've seen Jean-Baptiste Elisal, Benoit Payog, Antoine Dupont can all play nine and ten. Are we going to see Holmes lining up in a nine jersey for Bordeaux <laughs> over the next few months? I don't know. I thought Santi played a little bit. Santi Cordero played a bit last yeah, he year, does. so he might be putting his hand up first. But um, I've never like my dad was a halfback. He played um, 
he played for Waikato. He played um, quite a few like ITM, and, and I always I started playing half back, and then he would just give me too much advice, so that's why I moved more ten and sort of uh, a bit further out because I didn't want to have to. I was like, well, you never played ten, so you can't really tell me what to do. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's not not something. Yeah, it's not something I would say no to. I've not really ever. I've never trained there or anything like that, but if it got to the stage where, where it needed to happen, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, oh, oh yeah, I'd put my hand up, but hopefully it doesn't get to that. Cause it just shows as well. Like I saw Rory Cockett, my old mate from cast. Yeah. Who's now coach has had to be added back to the European roster to potentially fill. Cause they can't get a medical joker. Like there's no nines available. So mate, stranger things have happened. If Rory's getting dragged in as a backs coach, now playing back at nine, which you'll absolutely love. There's a good yeah, chance that you'll that. get roped into that. Yeah, you'll be <laughs> loving it. <laughs> yeah, it's strange. Now. I think as well, yeah, it's it's not the easiest time of the year. And, and even just, I think, Julian spoke a little bit about it in the press, like even with the, like the GIF and non-GIF stuff, it's it's not easy just to recruit a, a non-GIF and bring him in just with our our numbers and, and stuff like that, it's, it's become more difficult, I guess, like with the non-GIF quota, the GIF quota is going, well, not going up, but higher than they were previously. Um, you have to be a bit more strategic with that. So, yeah, the, the timing of the injury is not good. I hope, yeah, it's, yeah, he, his recovery is okay. I know um, from the initial reports, yeah, it's a very serious accident. Yeah, and hopefully, yeah. We don't suffer any more injuries at halfback. And given what happened to him, I don't know how you get around Bordeaux, Zach, whether you've got a Ferrari or a Peugeot, I don't, I don't know. No, but not, have they... <laughs> <laughs> not not yet, not yet. But have they? has there been any chat of, geez, guys, get a taxi? We're not, no scooters. There's no, have they banned scooters or is it just no, one of those freak scooters, accidents? So it was a bit of a, be a bit more aware, a bit more, careful i guess um i do have a scooter I, I i don't really take it out as soon as it gets cold so um that's just me personally being a bit of a, a bit of a princess but um yeah i guess i i, I know like now it's it is yeah, in france but like in bordeaux it's like the last two weeks it's, it's 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 cold now it's and the risk of the even just like the black ice and stuff at that time four or five a.m in the morning there's always a risk of that so yeah you got to be careful but yeah going out after i guess the decision is probably not 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 the best decision to make um but yeah it's i guess it's a bit of a wake up call not just to all of us but all the play, like players generally like yeah you can't take yeah i guess nine times out of ten yeah you're okay but when, when it happens it, it's not good and it's thankful that he's not done more damage i guess than 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 that and from a scrum half to a fly half, you mentioned him earlier on Machi Jalibur. You were signed because you're a similar style of player. He beat about 100 defenders at the weekend. Ridiculous numbers. Give us an idea as someone who's in a similar mould to him, obviously. What's he like on and off the field? And how good is he? No, he's, I really enjoy my relationship with Machu. I think he's, well, first of all, he's a unbelievable player he's a confident player he probably can get perceived uh, a little bit negative in the press and by other people uh, but he backs himself and that's something I admire he's, he, he, back, he backs himself to to beat players to take players on he, he uses his abilities and yeah not everything works but if you don't try anything like nothing works so I think I admire his his confidence his uh, mentality to to take the game on. Um, I, I sort of had a bit of a relationship before. We used to message each other and stuff on Instagram. And and I think he gave me a vote of confidence to come here as well. So I know he's he's got quite a big uh, sort of pull at the club. He's a big player at the club. So it was good that I had some kind of relationship with him before and and working with him. Yeah, it's been good. He's He, he, he works hard. He wants to improve. He wants to be the number one. 10 in France and and I think um yeah he, he probably didn't have the start to the season he wanted but since sort of the back end before the autumn nations and his sort of appearances off the bench there and coming back from that he's probably he's in really good form and and that's important for for Bordeaux to have him in form because he's a bit of a, a barometer I guess to, to the overall team performance that all sounds really positive but I've heard one negative story about him 
Is it true his dog is called Owen after Owen Farrell? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it is about. I know his dog is Owen. I don't know the, if that's I, I, is it's it. Tragic. I, don't, I, I can't confirm or deny, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can confirm tomorrow morning. You can ask him when you go in. Yeah, he's on holiday. He's on holiday this week. So yeah, he's actually lucky. Yeah, because uh, yeah, so oh, we'll see when he gets back. Speaking of Englishmen, Zach, you've had Tom Willis and Gabriel Ogre come in from Wasps. So how are they settling in? What are they like? Have they had to do any initiations or do they escape because they're the last minute additions? Yeah, we've got Tom's here at the moment. I don't know when Gabriel can He's not here at the moment. I think well, I think he comes January maybe or the end of yeah, end of the year. But yeah, so Tom's been here. He arrived. He arrived, I think, on the Wednesday we came back. So yeah, first day here. Christoph just been fired. <laughs> um, Holy yeah, not, shit. The, not, not the ideal start. Um, trying to get everything organized and stuff. I okay, get you got the meetings with the president, the coaches' meetings where you understand nothing. So it'd just be like, what is going on? Um, but no, he's been really good. He's adapted to the way we play. He asked questions. I've sort of, yeah, just gone through the way the strategy and shape and stuff like that. And I know he's the other, like John Dre and Kane helped him out with the line outs and he's picked it up really quick. Um, He's settled in now and it's good to see. Yeah. He's, uh, it's good to have him another addition to the back row. I think I didn't know too much about him. I knew probably a bit more about his brother, but no, he's a good ball carrier. He, he, he got some good minutes on the, on the weekend. Well, one of the, um Pierre Bouchard was was injured but yeah he, he played really well and I think yeah it's a, it's a good addition to have him I think he's settling well he's really enjoying it. I spoke to him a little bit we had a Christmas party last night spoke to him a little bit there and he's yeah settled in really well so yeah hopefully he continues and we can keep him for longer than just this season as well so no head shavings yet that's what we're saying <laughs> nah, no he, no he's, yeah he came in a good time you just sneak in midway through the season and yeah, there's no, there's no, real, there's no real time to to get your head shaved. So yeah, that was well played. And you mentioned the Christmas parties. That we should ask you about that. Where was it? What happened? Was it quiet? <laughs> nah, it was there wasn't much to report. It was like with families as well. So it was it was at a well, it's in Bordeaux. So it was at a chateau. Um, probably was not big enough for the event. But oh well, everyone was crammed <laughs> in a bit. <laughs> Kids running around, bumping into old people, but. No, nah, it was good. We all had to bring a plate. Um, yeah, so uh, I think most of the boys ended up just rushing off to the boulangere and picking up something just before on the way. So there was probably three quarters desserts, a uh, quarter mains and entrees. But no, nah, it worked. Um, no, nah, nothing, not not too too much. The kids got all their presents and yeah, it was a good night. And a bit of a change of pace for you this week. Obviously, things are more so back on track after that win top 14, back up to eighth. This week, you know, cut and it's European rugby. So what is the vibe in camp and the attitude towards European rugby? Like a big game away from home, Gloucester first up. What are you expecting and, and how is everyone feeling generally? Yeah, it's. I think it, it's going to be a tough game against Gloucester. They've been performing well in the Premiership. Um, we had a focus after the break of those two games against Perpignan and Breve in the position we were in. Now moving into the Champions Cup, I think we want to... We want to start well in the competition. We want, we know it's important. It's a four game competition. You need, if you need to attack this first game, you need to play, play well. We don't want to go over there and put in a performance that um, we're not happy with. So we're going there to, to play well, to, we want to win the game and, and continue to build confidence. We know if we take this, don't show the respect to this competition or or don't prepare well enough and and um, play bad in these next two games, it's going to be very difficult to come back into the top 14 and, and play well as well. So we're using these games we, to continue our season, to build confidence, to, to build a performance that – to do well – in the Champions Cup, but also to prepare for the games in the top 14 as well. Um, it, it doesn't get any easier, but we're taking this as a five five block sort of window. So we've got the two Champions Cup games and then three sort of games leading up to, to the new year. And when we had you on the show before, Zach, I remember you saying you were kind of building up to taking your French citizenship test. So yeah. how did it go? Have you got it? Are yeah. you a fully-fledged French well, citizen? 
No, I, I am. I, I, everything's done. That was all finished. Did my final interview in June. Yeah, before I went back to Oz. So everything's done. Um, submitted. So now I think the paperwork's in not and I'm waiting to. So it's been about four or five months and I'm yeah, waiting to hear every that everything's A-OK. But yeah, for me, it wasn't too bad. My wife, we did it at the same time. Um, and it was a lot more complicated. Um, she's born in Singapore. Um, trying to get the stuff from the Singapore embassy was was ridiculous um but yeah so it's all done now and we're just waiting uh waiting for the 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 officially uh, passports to arrive so fingers crossed it's not too long mate i had a, a message from a mate of yours so manny big manny miyafu at toulouse yeah. last week and he was like hey johnny just checking in um i've got my interview for my passport on friday this is like wednesday night he messaged yeah. me like, is there anything i should look at is there anything i should look at <laughs> before i was like oh mate so I sent him through like links to PDFs with like 100 questions on what you need to know for your naturalization. I was like, oh, mate, get studying, get cramming. He's like, oh, I'm sure we'll be okay. So I'll check in with him. Fingers crossed I went all right, but it's a grilling, eh? Hopefully he gets the same guy I had in Toulouse because he was actually really nice. Um, he... I was like, oh, you play for Toulouse? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you got to go. start with that. Um, <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Like I, I done preparation. Like, you can always prepare more. There's so much stuff that they can ask you and I was just hope you're hoping for the best um but yeah it wasn't like the person i had was yeah he was good he could have made it a lot worse for me um i know my wife it was m a little bit more difficult but she was okay she was more prepared as women usually are um but yeah i think um yeah i think it's a bit of a lottery who you get but i'm assuming he's doing it to lose i'm pretty sure that they should uh appreciate rugby so i'm oh, sure it'd be fine not just that um, Johnny knowing knowing Fabian Galte Manny could be quite useful to him so he might have had a word as well yeah he probably or you, or, might be taking the test <laughs> be doing the interview. I was like Manny just get down there in your fool to lose tracksuit if that all fails get on the phone to Macron that worked for Max Van Dyke um, yeah I wish I did that <laughs> and so maybe like French pens passport and then you're also in the middle of your qualifications so you did one last year coaching you've got another one to do next year which Jerome is also in the middle of doing his is the plan eventually to try and French citizenship and stay or would you like to head back home at the end of your career? What are you thinking? Yeah, like the reason for getting my passport uh, is to want to stay in France. I didn't, it wasn't a necessity. I've got my UK passport. I've got a 10-year visa here as well, but I want to stay stay in France. Um, I'm, that's why I'd like to get as much of my coaching stuff done while I'm still playing if possible. Um, so yeah, I've done my sort of first level one while in Toulouse, my BP Jeps, and I want to start my DO um, Jeps next next year. Um, but yeah, the the ideal situation for me to stay in France and and coaching something I would like to do. Um, I'm doing a little bit of stuff at the moment just with the um some of the women's some of the girls uh uh the french 15 and the sevens and just doing some kicking skill stuff there which is which i've done, only done a little bit of which i'm quite enjoying because that's an area i'd sort of like to get into that skills um kicking side of things but yeah that's something i i'd like to do post rugby and it gives me a reason to stay in france i guess so yeah, that's that's where my head's sort of at, and I'm hopeful to get all as many of my qualifications done while I'm still playing, so it makes that transition easier, I guess. You've got plenty of years still playing left, Zach, but Johnny mentioned if it is Yannick Brew next season at Bordeaux, he's more of a director of rugby type. He's there next week in a different capacity with the Sharks. Just buy him a coffee, a nice steak or something. You could have a player coach role next year. Who knows? Yeah, oh, that wouldn't be too bad. But yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? But I think, yeah, I don't know too much about Yannick, but hopefully, oh, I don't know who's going to take over. But yeah, play coach. I think there's enough enough going on just playing. I think I, I, I sort of see how the coaches work. I've sort of even just watched Jerome last year and seen the difference. So doing it both at the same time. <laughs> Mate, yeah, just stay, stay a player as salary, long as you can. <laughs> Oh man, I, I don't know how appealing it would be. Yeah, I'm not sure how my wife would appreciate it either. Mate, before you go quickly, I have to ask you, like, your first trip over to King's Home with the boy, like, what are you expecting over there? 
um and how are you going to win it like big weekend first game of european rugby what are going to be key for you going over to england and starting positively because weirdly i reckon a lot of teams or french teams now with the the travels to south africa and further afield if they don't get those first two games right i reckon they'll throw in the towel and chuck in bomb squad so going over this weekend what do you boys need to get right to knock over gloucester yeah it's it's not it's not it's not an easy place to play i've actually played there quite a few times um i played the i had had them in my pool twice in the challenge cup at large shell um wanted to lose uh in the champions cup so this is the fourth time I, i've played them over there and, and 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 for an english team like the atmosphere is yeah it's quite vibrant it's it's very loud especially the shed it's cool. like it's it's different to yeah it's, it's it's got a bit more of a a french feel to it i guess in the way that the crowd gets involved in the game so I guess as a French team, as a visiting team, you want to take the crowd out of it. So it's important to, to start well. Um, yeah, Gloucester, I guess, since uh, George Givington's taken over, has had a real big focus on on their mall um, and the dominance that has, scoring tries off their mall, penalties off their mall. Um, so for us, it's important to not give them the opportunity to, to use it. Um, whether that's discipline, not giving them penalties, um, not giving, keeping the ball in, in field as well. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a strategy that um, we want to go over there and play with. Um, it's not going to be easy to implement. Gloucester, um, yeah, they're going to attack the competition. They, they're, they're in good form. So it's important for us to, to start the game well and to, and to not... I guess even if it's not going well, the way the format is, you got four games and and, and four try bonus point um, and the losing bonus point. I think it's important to continue to play in this competition. Um, and even if you're not getting the four points, two points can be important. What it's what eight teams go through out of twelve. So for us, we have the mentality to go out and win the game, but to also continue to play for that eighty minutes and make sure that we. Um, bring back as many points as we can. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Zach, and sharing your insight into everything going on in Bordeaux and good luck in the West Country this weekend. Pleasure. Thanks, guys. And yeah, thanks for having me on again. Pleasure, mate. Catch you soon. Cheers, Zachy. Cheers, boys. Always good to chat to Zach, Johnny, and very interesting on Christoph as well. Yeah, he's a really good boy. Um, And again, I think that's just what people want to hear is that it's not Christoph's a bad egg or... He's a fucking good coach. Like that that's the honest. Um and that's what comes across with Zach. There's just been certain things or things that have been spoken about or verbalized that have gone down wrong. And there's been a clash somewhere behind the scenes that we still don't know the full ins and outs of. But I'm fairly sure that Christoph will rebound quickly with a big club. Um and he'll be coaching somewhere come June, preparing another preseason and doing a decent job. But uh, for Bordeaux. And for Zach, um, like a big job now to, with just the assistance, get them back into the top six and get them competing again, whilst also managing European rugby. But yeah, awesome to have him on. Great lad. Um, and yeah, hopefully he'll come back on soon. Right. We're not going to chat too much about the top 14 this week because we're coming out a bit later in the week than usual. And it's all about the Champions Cup build up. But we do definitely need to find out what your meter moment of the week. So it could have been Matthew Jalibert. You, you mentioned how many mm. defenders. He, he beat someone like 30 by himself. He's a freak show. Uh, but I'm going for a team performance. There's only one away victory at the weekend. I was working on that game for via play again, doing the commentary, and it was Rassing, mate. Um, they went down to Toulon, absolutely written off, no chance, um, but full of intent, intensity. Defensively, they were phenomenal. Their line out made Charles Olivon and Toulon's look like a shambles. Um, my old mate Baptiste Shuznu running the show um, from Bayonne now at Racing. Um, but they came away with a really gritty victory. So meter moment of the week was racing, the smash and grab in Toulon and the only away win of the weekend. They were awesome. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can now get 20% off any full-price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20, and you'll get 20% off any full-price item at meter.com perfect for christmas absolutely maybe not on the barbecue unless you're where you are johnny it's probably a million degrees still over there (laughs) (laughs) i'm struggling i'm battling for christmas presents this year um 
and I've just bought two meters. There you go. I've used that discount code. I've bought two family members. They'll be getting them in their stocking and they're actually quality. So we won't talk about the top 14 on the pitch, but off the pitch, plenty going on. Will Rollins to Racing. Joe Marchant, we've spoken about before, confirmed to Stade Francais. And Luke Houndicky to Montpellier is probably the most interesting one, Johnny, because he's kind of in his prime and definitely in England's top two hookers. So it's a big move. Also looking at the fact that Eddie hasn't used many hookers at all. So who's coming in behind them? Um, but he mentioned it's a big money move. He couldn't turn it down. A huge move for his family. Um, Will Rollins as well to Racing. You've got to imagine that's the same. The interesting point for him now is he doesn't qualify like Dan Bigger does. Dan Bigger's got 100 caps. Again, his introduction at Toulon at the weekend was incredible. Took the microphone with the president on the field, spoke perfect French, addressed all the Toulon fans. They absolutely love him already, and he hasn't touched the ball. Um, but for Will Rollins, it's going to be interesting. Are the Welsh Union going to change that rule and allow him to come back or not? We'll wait and see. Um, a big move for Joe March, and I'm really I'm, I'm pumped for him that he's gone to Stade Francais because um, they're flying as well. And Luke Cameron Dickey, as we said, like too much money to turn down. A big reflection as well on the premiership, the money problems that are going, the salary cap coming down. Like these boys are just the start. Like Will coming from the Welsh Federation, but Luke Cameron Dickey and Joe coming over, uh, along with Dan Bigger, is the start of, I think, what we'll see to be a lot of signatures happening in the next two months. Given the changes happening in Wales with Warren Gatlin going back, it'd be very interesting to see if that 60 cap rule has changed. A lot of people think it will be, but there's no sense that it's going to change in England. So therefore, those two moves, Luke Cowan Dickey and Joe Marshall, but, at their age, particularly interesting. But but you have to you have to protect your domestic product. Like take Wales, for example, like with, with their regions, if they let the top 10% leave, and I understand letting them leave, but what does that leave you with in Wales? What is your domestic product? give you can you get bums on seats to come watch what essentially will become academy teams because the difference between them and scotland with the same sort of player numbers wales just ahead is that scotland filled two professional teams so the, the sort of talent is still there when you spread that over four it becomes a little bit more sparse so they've got a real challenge to keep as much as they can whilst also allowing key players to go and pick up big salaries elsewhere so it, it's really tough them and england's the same mate like, even though they've lost two sides the Premiership has to protect its product. It has to ring, ring fence itself and look after domestic talent and get them playing English rugby. So it's attractive for people to come and watch and buy tickets because like domestic ticket sales in the Premiership are down 10 to 15% this year. So they need to make it as attractive as possible for punters to come and be part of our game. And we spoke about Eddie Jones earlier on. It looks like Steve Borthwick is very much going to be the man to replace him, although not confirmed yet, obviously. <laughs> One man who sort of threw his own hat into the ring like not so long ago and then has subsequently taken it out. Ronan O'Gara is very yep. much staying at La Rochelle, isn't he? Well, he signed an extension to 2027. And that's one of the things with Rog is that he doesn't shy away or answer questions dishonestly. Again, Popolan, the, the 10 who's leaving the club this year, spoke in the press this morning about how like love him or hate him, you, you get a direct answer no matter what the question is. Some people find that really hard to deal with, but Obviously, if you ask Rog, how would you feel about coaching the English side? Yeah, it'd be a great job. Like, why wouldn't that be a great job? One of the biggest unions in the world, of course, it'd be a great job. But for him now and for La Rochelle, crucially, after winning that Champions Cup, being consistent across both competitions that they're involved in, developing some serious talent from within as well, it's a great to tie him down. To have him there for the next four seasons is a massive coup for, for La Rochelle. So let's focus on the Champions Cup then. I suppose out of the French sides, they look fairly strong and looking at some of the fixtures, but who, if you were going to call it now, is going to win it? Uh, let's start outside France. Uh, Leinster again. Watched them last weekend beating Ulster with 14 men. Uh, a magical comeback. <sighs> Mate, they're just freakish every year. Um, and you think, yep, you watch that game. Yep, they can do that with 14 men. They can take on anyone in Europe. Saracens played 9-1-9 nine, nine in the Prem, head and shoulders above everyone else at the minute. Then you look at the South African teams coming in, which is a total wild card because not many teams know that much about them in France, but I wouldn't bet against either the Bulls or the Stormers. Like I'm not sure how that would go down with punters generally if they were to win the European Cup. And then domestically, you look at France, La Rochelle and Toulouse absolutely leading from the front. I don't think Racing 
have the strength they maybe had a couple of seasons ago. Um, guys like Vakatawa moving on, a few different reasons. I just think they maybe don't have the punch that they did. My wild card would be Montpellier. Um, the fact that they've got London Irish and the Ospreys in their pool stage means that they should fly through and get a decent seeding um, in the next round. Um, but realistically, mate, there's five, six, seven teams, like Zach mentioned as well, the top eight sides go through. Um, so I've got no idea. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm One really of those eight or something you mentioned there, eh? It, yeah, it, exactly. But that, like, you got, that, that's the beauty of it. Again, you look at world rugby, the international scene that we've talked about, it's so much more entertaining and interesting because any team on their day can be anyone. And I think that really is the same with the Champions Cup at the minute. If you've got eight to 10 teams across the board that really any one of them could pip it. Um, so no, looking forward to kicking off this weekend. It should be class. And apart from Zach and Bordeaux's trip to Gloucester, what are the pick of round one's games? Uh, Racing v Leinster will be absolutely huge uh, and a real experience for Stu Lancaster. Like I know he's obviously been over and seen around the installations and the training ground and the, but to be there coaching for Leinster against your future team um, will be pretty special mentally. Obviously we know he'll be doing his job and he'll be Le Leinster coach, but um, emotionally it'll be uh, interesting for him and and pretty cool for the fans to watch as well. Munster Toulouse, um, who've had some, massive battles over the past few seasons Jerome couldn't join us because he's been asked to do extra prep for that game on a Monday night um, and I'll be at La Rochelle Northampton um, for BT which I'm looking forward to as well hopefully catch up with big Greg Aldrich for beer after that one as well so mate the opening weekend there's a few massive rounds um, to look forward to all on BT Sport um, so looking forward to them starting absolutely thanks Johnny a big thanks to Zach Holmes for joining us as well and thanks to all you guys for listening make sure you hit subscribe leave us a nice review if you can check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube and we'll be back with another episode next week au revoir Johnny cheers everyone Bye.